Okay, mind your P's and Q's. It's all on tape now, whatever you say. Good morning. Um, we're excited that we'll be discussing 2 Corinthians. And when I mention 2 Corinthians, what immediately comes in your mind? <laughs> and that tells you everything you need to know right there. It doesn't stick out, but as we'll see, there are some of the most precious quotes from Paul in 2 Corinthians that you know. You just don't associate them with 2 Corinthians. Yeah, and so we want to talk about that. These are these are wonderful texts. Uh, we'll read in a second, a chapter four, you can turn to it, treasures in jars of clay. Yeah. We always use that, right? About the, the vulnerability of, of God blessing us and taking, but, but we hold those blessings like clay jars. We're very fragile, right? And, and uh, crack pots. It's, it's a, we're crack pots. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> 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 so uh, we'll see time and time again that some of these precious texts that you do know, we just don't link them with Second Corinthians. And so um, I, I'm excited again. I just want to talk about the Sunday Forum briefly that we're doing uh, the next iteration. Those who are there Sunday, next iteration on witnessing, just practical suggestions. Mm -hmm. And uh, this Sunday, um, Tom Jackson. Pastor Williard are going to do the Sunday Forum talking more about practical nature of witness. Uh, Tom, if you were there at the Sunday Forum, said he just thought that was very important, that it was practical, it was hands-on, it was, he found it helpful, and he thought we needed to continue the conversation. So he's going to do that with Pastor Williard on Sunday. I'm uh, excited about that. Um, for the upcoming week, I'm also excited that we're going to talk about student protests at university. So we're going to get back into the thick of things. We'll bring back our uh, seven principles of civil discourse. <laughs> um, uh, and we're going to bring in one of our members who is an expert in this area. He's actually a consultant. And for the last several months, he's been flying all over the country consulting with university presidents on what to do. And, and how do you balance all the issues at stake? Uh, free speech, uh, one, but also civil, uh, non nonviolent protests. Um, how do you lift up the tragedies in Gaza at the same time as the tragedies of the hostages and the attack on Israel? There's just so much going on. Okay, uh, so much going on. And universities, and I, I knew this at the seminary, they're unique places because there's so many constituents that all have different opinions. So the students are, are have certain things that are important to them. Uh, faculty have certain things that are important to them. Donors have certain things that are important to them. And you can go on and on. And the public has certain things that it's watching, right? And, and so with all those constituents all weighing in and having different opinions, on how one should respond, it's really difficult for university presidents to balance it. Right. You know, who do you favor here? And, and these are your students, right? And, and yet, uh, uh, what are the rules of the road as far as civil protests? Yeah. Most of us went through this uh, years ago with the Vietnam protests. And so we have some experience either we were uh yeah we could have been on one side of the road or the other depending on where we were in that but i think we can also look back and see the mistakes that were made and hopefully there's some learnings uh from our own histories that we bring to bear as we take a look at the students now from columbia all the way to you out to ucla you know and so uh anyway that um it's uh, mark heckler will be i'll be interviewing him uh, he's out at the park, but he was up until just a couple of years ago, maybe two, maybe a year and a half, uh, the president of Valparaiso. Longer ago. University. He's been out at the park for longer than two years. Yeah, yeah. but pres as president. He stayed on as president there even after he retired. They kept him on to deal with COVID. 
And uh, I think they were finding it difficult to find a new president during COVID for obvious reasons. And uh, uh, so he's, he did uh, more than his share of time uh, there, but he's considered uh, an expert. He's hired for this reason. He can't, of course, talk about specific schools, nor do we want him. Uh, obviously he's a consultant, so those are confidential, but we can hear what he's learned in, in the process. And so uh, uh, it's something I'm looking forward to. Uh, that'll be next week. That's the next year. That will be not Sunday the 5th. That will be Sunday the 12th. Oh, okay. so mm -hmm. This Sunday, again, we'll go with uh, witnessing. And part of that's talking about the, res the, the uh, season of resurrection. And after every resurrection story, it's like Jesus says, now you are witnesses to these things. So now, what does that, I mean, what does that mean? Right. So that's important. Uh, we're also, um, some of you know this, but we're celebrating uh uh, BB, uh, particularly, she uh, preached at the Welka uh, gathering on Saturday. You were there. She was unbelievably wonderful. I, I can't praise her enough. She had the audience in the palm of her hands. There was about 75 women. She was funny. She talked about the spirit, and you really felt the spirit in the room. I told her there was only one thing I thought she was going to do, and she didn't. When when spirit say Rura. That rock. <laughs> but she talked so much about the spirit and women being lionesses because they were honoring um, Luther's wife, Katie. Um, she had her gospel and then she stepped off and then she just was, the words came out. I mean, she never hesitated. I told her, I said, wow, you were phenomenal. And she thought it, they were all praising her. She really was her. And she needs, to, she needs to hear that because it's important. Yeah, well, it's a, it was a big deal for her, but also for Emmanuel Academies because she got an invitation to Welka, right? Mm -hmm. The women of the LCA. And they had given her a scholarship. So this was fruition of a scholarship. Yep. Seeing your pupil in front of you and seeing how she's just continuing to blossom. Yep. She really was good. So it was kind of a big deal. Yeah, really like, uh, all up and down. Anything else that... Uh, are we ready to jump into 2 Corinthians? That book that no one... <laughs> can remember what it's about okay first corinthians was what let's just review because now we're going to lean in second corinthians problem solving book right so uh paul founds the church in corinth and now they're having problems and so he's going to write a letter to try to solve the problem. So we mentioned five problems, and each time he goes through a process of saying, here's the gospel, and if you believe the gospel, that goes a long way into solving that issue that had emerged. So it's a big deal. If you remember, one of the issues was what they're gonna call this week, these super apostles. Now, what is a super apostle? I can only compare it to a TV preacher back in the day. Someone who's massively talented, right? Uh, individually wealthy. And they come and visit your little Lutheran church out in the prairie of Iowa or Minnesota or wherever you live, right? And so here you've got this humble church setting, Corinth with Paul. Remember, that despite the fact we elevate Paul, he was not a good speaker, and he was not handsome, and he was short. I was going to say, and, and, and he had big feet. No, no, I don't know. Uh, so the whole idea here is he's not impressive. And now you've got this TV preacher coming in, the super apostles, who are incredibly good speakers, <laughs> uh, who have wealth behind them, and therefore, as many would say, the favor of God, look how God is blessed, uh, and they're opposed to Paul. And he's going to go, okay, wait a minute, I founded this congregation, <laughs> right? right, on Christ, not on some super apostle. All right, that is a tough conversation. You can just imagine 
um, the, the dynamics. You can feel in this book now the hurt of Paul. He's having to justify himself. He's okay, I've got credentials, you know. Let me give you my credentials. He'll even say he saw Jesus. And you're going, okay, wait a minute, you know, back off, Paul. But that's what he says. He had a vision of Jesus. Jesus knocked him off a horse, right? But the super apostles are saying, who are you? You never even saw Jesus. You can't call yourself an apostle. And Paul's going to come back and say, oh, is that your definition of being an apostle? Let me give you my definition of being an apostle. So you can, you can feel the tension, the back and forth. And uh, sometimes I think the poor people of Corinth are trying to figure this out, right? Yeah, we love Paul. He was here. But, you know, he's not impressive. These guys come in and are giving donations to the church. They're good speakers. Look at people are rallying around them. And Paul's saying they're not preaching Christ. Oh boy, now we got we got issues. And that's second Corinthians. <laughs> now um, some would say, do we have one letter here or two? This will not come up in the uh, video today. But when you read it through, I hope some of you will, there's a different tone in chapters one through nine, verses 10 through 13. So some say, ah, uh, maybe that's two letters that have been put together. So, I mean, I've heard theories on this. I don't know. The problem is, Paul leaves. He, he, he writes the first letter. And then he says, I'm, I came back. I visited you again. And the visit didn't go well. So we know he came back a second time. And the visit blew up. And he wrote another letter. That's, you know, and we don't have it. So we know he wrote the letter. We don't have it. And so some are saying, oh, but maybe we do have it. Maybe it's stuck on to this other letter, which is the third letter. So maybe they put letters two and three together. That's just one theory, just one theory, because of the difference in tone. So in one to nine, you'll have this gentle tone as if it's all been fixed. All the tension uh, that emerged in his second visit has all been put to the side and praise God. And then chapters 10 to 13 go, you know, and you're going, wait a minute, wh why the change of tone? And there are other explanations. As you know, this is what scholars love to debate is <laughs> what, what's happening here. But we do know he founds the church they have problems. He writes 1 Corinthians. Tension break out between the church, the super apostles, and Paul. So he goes back again. This really doesn't go well. It's a bad visit. All sorts of tensions break out. And so now he writes a letter we don't have. Maybe we don't have. And now we get the third installation. And the question is, again, has the situation, have all the problems in Corinth been solved or not by what we read here in the book? Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions so far just on that? The super apostles, um, they're saying Paul isn't an apostle because he never saw Jesus. Who okay. is he? Yeah. Yeah. Why, are you guys, why are you guys following him? What authority so does he have? See. He's even got big feet. I mean, what a, you know, I'm kidding. But it's that sort of put down. He's not handsome. He's an ugly guy. What, what can he do? If I was Peter, I'd be saying the same thing. Yeah. He, he never met Jesus. You know, Jesus appeared to us. Jesus commissioned us. You know, who's this guy? Well, and, and with Peter, of course, now Peter's friendly now with Paul. But at one time, he also was killing us. Right. Yes. Right. So, you know, it's like, I never did trust him. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, you, you get that tension. Now, it's the super apostles are not the apostles. The right. Apostles. But they're claiming they saw Jesus, and they're, or they're just claiming something, but not that. I think it's more undermining uh, Paul, Paul. Okay. so that they feel like um, it's our ministry now. It's our ministry. And when Paul says, but I'm an apostle, and I've got special authority 
oh, by the way, you are my children here, right? You are my children. Mm -hmm. And the super apostles are going, no, that's not how it works. Why don't you just go away, <laughs> right? And we can take over from here because we know how to build the church. We know how to do these things. And you have no special authority here. And so that's, I don't know if you've ever had to do this, but every once in a while, if you're being attacked, it could be at work or at home and you have to defend yourself. That never comes off well, right? Sometimes you have to do it. You say, wait a minute, you know, I've got an education or I've been trained for this and I happen to be good at what I do. And, you know, I was here with the founder of the company and I kind of know how to run it. That all sounds defensive. And you're, and that's, boy, this book's got a lot of that defensiveness uh, built into it. But we're finding a little bit about who Paul is as he defends himself and tries to say, you're my children, I have authority. I even got to see Jesus. Well, it was a vision, but I, nevertheless, I saw him in a vision and he knocked me off a horse and I'm still an apostle. Who were these super <coughs> apostles? Who yeah, I describe them as TV preachers. Um, obviously, there's no TV. But they're obviously talented, itinerant preachers who are going around. Uh, we have them today. Who met the original apostles? Mm -hmm. mm, that's no. the question. It doesn't say here. I'd have to take a look at that more. But uh, Google says they're false prophets who go behind Paul trying to get his converts to come. To that would be Paul's critique here. Right? Right. These are false prophets. But for the Corinthian church, they not, they're not sure of that. Right, right. They're not. They, they, these are just talented preachers. And we've got these itinerant preachers today. Um, Lutherans, we don't. Um, have them in our churches very often, but other churches with uh, say Sunday evening <clears throat> services or Wednesday services, they have these traveling preachers who come and you know you, you can easily come in and undermine the local congregation or the leadership of the local congregation. So you can imagine, this didn't happen, but you can imagine in the 70s and the 80s, you go to a Billy Graham gathering. The stadium is packed. And he gets up and says, come to Jesus. And oh, by the way, there's no way you can follow Jesus if you stay in your Lutheran church. Not possible. So we want you to come to us. We're going to arrange new church situations locally because we know how to do church. We know how to be faithful. We know how to follow Jesus, right? And your local, those mainline churches, they're hopeless. Oh, we'd say, okay, now the fight's on, right? Because some of our people probably would have left. Because Billy Graham was charismatic. These were large gatherings. It was all very impressive. And he says he saw God in a dream. He saw God in a dream, right? How are you going to fight that? How are you going to fight it? <laughs> what can you say? No, you didn't. You weren't there. So I, you have to compare it with, with you know, some of these uh, uh, dramatic. Now, Billy Graham was less a TV preacher as he was a stadium preacher. But that probably is more like what's in Corinth. It's live. It, you know, they're coming around. They have big gatherings. You find this in Africa all the time. You know that the traveling evangelists will come. They'll fill stadiums, and they're they're brilliant at talking. But now Paul's going to say, "Yeah, they're brilliant at talking, but they're false prophets. False prophets." And so now is the back and forth, the theological back and forth of what is a an apostle. What's right or what's wrong? What is the gospel? And so that's why 2 Corinthians, you know, sometimes we learn more. Well, there, we all know that through our failures or through difficult times because the mind sharpens and we see, okay, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? And so we're getting to learn a little bit about the early church and about Paul and these letters because the wheels are coming off. And we read that last week. I think it's important to compare these texts of 1 Corinthians with the second chapter of Acts, where it, it describes the early church as in idealistic um, verses. Oh, yeah. They all got together and they, they shared, broke bread every day, and they loved yeah. each other. They gave everybody a hug before they went home at night. Yeah. And, for three years, and, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Two months. <laughs> Two, three weeks, you know. And, and, and then you go, oh, wait a minute. It wasn't all coming up roses. Yeah. You read First Corinthians, you go, oh, that church is like ours. Like all of us. 
like all of us. Because when you read Acts, you're wondering, who, how do you live that with that much love? And here you're going, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's like watching the Jerry Springer show, the ecclesiastical version. What's the difference, or is there a difference between a disciple and an apostle? I, I always have a, don't really quite understand the difference. Uh, the disciples are, with the, with the term, is those who follow Jesus. The apostles are those that Jesus sent out. But are we being sent out from the church as well? Are we being sent out from... Yeah. So some church? will use, actually, those terms today that we all have an apostolic call, right. which means a mission missional call so they didn't have an argument against Paul then because this is what we're still commissioned to do we're still commissioned to go out and preach the word and at least them so that's why i was trying to understand well that. that's how we use the, the, the word we would link both of them in our baptisms to say we've both been called to follow jesus and we've been sent out right. in mission mm -hmm. um, but in this text apostle has a narrower definition which is were you with jesus did jesus send you out were you in his presence? And, and uh, here the super apostles are saying, no, you, uh, don't go there, Paul. Just don't go there. You were not there. So we use the more extended version of being sent out. Where does the term evangelism or evangelist fit into that disciple or... That's good. I want to stick with first and second Corinthians here. <laughs> Hold that thought. How yeah. Paul. <laughs> you know, I think Paul would um, associate a, a, a evangelizing with both calls, right? Sharing the word of God. All disciples have been given that mandate. The sending out of the 12, the sending out of the 70. By the way, the sending out of the 70, remember, was a sense of sending out people to the whole world that we all take that call. And evangelizing, meaning not just uh, converting unchristians, but sharing the gospel with everyone, Christian and non Christian, I think would be associated with both. I, I'm not, I'd have to go back to check first and second Corinthians about how it's used there. Um, but that's the way, I mean, if you're just asking in general, I think it's, mm -hmm. a, a, we'd say evangelizing, sharing the gospel, is at the core of everything we do. It an is the core. That's why we're an evangelical church, because we hold evangelizing at the core of everything. And you saw that last week in First Corinthians. And how, remember the, his methodology of solving mm -hmm. these problems? He said, okay, here's the gospel. Now, as we review what the gospel is, how does that help us solve these problems of worship, you know, the resurrection of, of, of all the, of, of clashes in the body. And so he, he keeps going back to the core and we call that evangelizing. Even for Christians, we need to be evangelized. We have to be brought back to what the core means as far as problem solving or living our lives out as disciples. And let's take a look at a couple of these texts. Go to Second Corinthians 4. You want to start us there, Melissa? Sure. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. Okay, to what might that be? How might I abuse the word of God and use deceitful practices? Churches do it all the time. That's a hint. One on the mission field was, I don't know if you heard the phrase, rice Christians, where if you come to church first, then afterwards we'll give you rice to eat. Oh, so we could easily do that out at the park, for example. We have, we're feeding us with 755 families last week. And we could say, ah, you don't get anything until you come to church. And we'd have a massive church already of 755 families, each having six in a family. So we'd already have a church of four to 5,000. Using the 
food of meals of hope basically to bribe people and people would say okay if that's why i do to get the money i get the food i'll be in church those are deceptive practices Coercion. <laughs> but, but often this was done in the mission field over centuries because you know the the people back home wanted to see numbers and so you can write back and say well we got four thousand people in church wow that's amazing how'd you do that well we bribed them with food you know you, know, you wouldn't say that, you wouldn't say that. Your, your, your mission to a basic need Hunger, yeah. right? That can work with your church for a lot of reasons. Hunger being one. Mm -hmm. And hunger of the broken soul to come to church and sit in the pews is the biggest one. Might hear that broken soul. Mm -hmm. So, so there's other. You know, you could say someone's feeling very, very guilty uh, in their lives, how they live their life, and uh, you come in and and the pastor says something. Well, you know. That's God can deal with that, especially, you know, if you take out your checkbook. Because <laughs> that's sometimes how we get rid of our guilt is we go we buy things, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of a classic practice. That's um, right to Lucas time when they were getting money. For indulgences. Like, oh, in other words, there will be deceptive practices. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, sometimes um, we used to have preschools uh, growing up in the Missouri Senate. I'm not blaming the Missouri Senate. I think a lot of churches did it. And if you were a member of the church, then you got uh, a significant reduction on your fees, which were considerable because it was a preschool. So people were joining, the young families would join the church. And why were they joining the church? Just to get the break. So are those deceptive practices? Is that just smart? You know, um, those are debated. Uh, but that... These were some of the, the things that we've experienced, all of us, right? And so um, so he's addressing these here. And, and, and Corinth is working through the same things. Okay. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, which is the image of God. Well, what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants. For Jesus, said, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So he's talking about the glory of God. And, and this is important because. In some of our churches, even today, they don't want to look at the cross. They'll say the cross is the thing of the past. Now it's all about glory and power, yeah. right? Jesus has won the victory, so there's no more, you know, pain, suffering. It's all good news now and all. So if you're, because Jesus won the, the victory, uh, if you're not healed, because Jesus has already provided the healing for you, for example, it's your fault. Because you don't believe in Jesus' victory. So he's talking about the glory of Jesus, the one who died, and will call us also to suffering. That's not a, that's not a feel-good message, right? That Jesus had to die and suffer on our behalf, and will call us to a life of discipleship, which is to follow him, which might lead us to the cross as well. So you can imagine these super apostles are coming in and going, no, that's all in the past. Now it's all good news and, you know, victory and power and healing. And, and, uh, and there's something, you know, we call it maybe even the prosperity gospel today that, you know, when you believe in Jesus, then the blessings flow. And so the preacher stands up and says, look at me. Yes, I live in a $75 million home. That just shows you how blessed I am. Send more money. <laughs> Send more money. So that's the kind of super apostle today. And they're usually incredibly good speakers, but the gospel is different. They're not going to talk about uh, uh, discipleship in terms of suffering, for example. Uh, and this is what we're getting here. So then now how he follows it. So when he talks about the glory of Jesus, 
He's talking about the glory of Jesus displayed on the cross, which is a little bit counterintuitive. He's suffering. He's, he's being tortured. That's his glory. So the super apostles are saying that makes no sense. And Paul says, but that's the gospel. So you can, you can feel a little bit of the conflict here. And then look what he says here. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Okay. Oof. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> That's a difficult message. Now, it's a beautiful one, and I think we've all heard this one, right? You know, usually we talk about them being perplexed and we talk about Paul's life. He's going through shipwrecks oh, and, yes. you know, you, 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 some of you have been in Ephesus and have seen the places where, you know, he's facing, you know, wild animals and torture and you name it, you know. Uh, so he's talking about that, but he's giving a positive spin. That's the life of a disciple. And we all carry the death of Christ in us. So that. You know, that's not the power of positive thinking. And so that's part of the conflict that I'm trying to get at. It, you know, it's, it's different than uh, Norman Vincent Peale. <laughs> I mean, this is quite complex. We are always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus. Yeah. Woof the. So we, the, 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 as Lutherans, we usually talk about that is daily baptism, daily we're drowned to sin and we're raised up by Christ to new life. It's a daily occurrence. And that's where this language of, of Martin Luther and daily baptism comes. Each day, sin has to be drowned in us so that the new life of Christ can emerge. All right. Um, maybe one, let's see. Um, here's another famous one. Uh, chapter 6, verse... Um, 14. And this was, many of us were quoted this text in our teens or our 20s when we were ready to get married yes. to a Roman Catholic. Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. So I, anybody's got a testimony, but this is the text that was always quoted if you uh, were getting married across religious lines. Even if you I think there's a story there, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sensing, I'm sensing some. Uh, a little controversy with our parents. <laughs> did they quote this text? Well, well let's read it. First, we'll... <laughs> Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Yahweh? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, another quote, come out, of, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And another quote, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the, the, it's interesting that the quote, usually in our families, was just the first half of the sentence. It wasn't, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. It was, don't be unequally yoked. That was the quote that I always heard as a kid, which meant you, you um, couldn't date yeah. anyone different from you. That was being unequally yoked. I, when I was growing up with the Jewish kids that I hung out with, their parents said, oh, you can hang out with them, you know, at school and be their friends, but you can't date them, mm -hmm. the Christians. You can't date them. And what was the rationale? Well, because you want two Jews to marry, you got more Jews. And if you married a Gentile girl, yeah, 
grandchild will be an outcast, really. Mm -hmm. But you know, I was raised a Lutheran and my mother never said who I could date or who I couldn't. I crossed a lot of lines. <laughs> his parents might not have liked his parents might not have liked the idea that he was marrying a Protestant, but my parents never objected. So I, we have to take a, a little pause here, and um, we uh, Ray and I experienced a miracle last Monday. <laughs> this Monday, on the fifth hole of the number one golf course. Where uh, Ray in um, uh, hit, hit, got a hole in one, and uh, that's your second. Yes. But uh, we were playing with Jim Clinky, and he said the first one he's ever um, observed on that golf course. And so uh, you know, it, it, the ball disappears, but you know, at our age, you wonder is it my glasses? Yeah, right. <laughs> it must have rolled Did it go in? Whether you know, and so. Um, <laughs> So, so in any case, you got you got a, uh, I got a winner. You got a winner. Right? Yeah. <laughs> crossed all the lines though to get the winner, right? But that was this was uh, used, I would guess, with in many. Don't be unequally yoked. Was uh, Protestants, Catholics, Lutherans, uh, you know, uh, Jews, Christian, um, and there's some truth to that. There, it's harder. Marriage is hard as it is. But the rate of um, divorce among those of different religious persuasions uh, goes up dramatically. So it doesn't mean you can't do it. It means you got to uh, tackle that. you got to, you know, just like any challenge in a marriage, you got to say, okay, if I'm a Jew and a Christian, what is that going to mean? Now, here in Corinth, they're struggling with this because it was a big temple town and there's a lot of religious practice, Roman Greek religions. And so the Christians are getting married to, you know, nice girls from the local temple. And so how, is that okay? And that's part of what's behind the don't be unequally yoked. Then the other question was, if I've already married, you know, uh, this girl from the local temple, what do I do after the marriage? And again, these are all addressed by the New Testament. And there it was, keep your wife. I would think too that it, it was a very practical thing to marry a Jewish person because the Christians were small in number at the beginning, right? And the, the Jewish people were. So by this time, 55, 56, okay, was it different? Um, the Gentiles are starting to grow. Okay. And, and so that's now the question uh, that Paul wrestles with in Romans, for example. Why is it that the Gentiles? are so responding to the gospel, but our Jewish brethren are not. So this is, remember 55, 56, what's interesting about this date is it's before the first gospel. It's before Mark. So these are really early texts compared to the gospel readings. Uh, I always think the gospel of Mark's right around 66. 10 years after this. So it's still, um, Oral tradition, telling the stories of Jesus orally in people's homes in a church, right? Uh, and now the Gentiles are getting larger. Um, you know, the Pharisees when are. Did Jesus died around 30? 30, 33. Okay. Everybody debates that. When did um, the Christians start, like, stop going, keeping the Sabbath on Saturday? Oh, interesting. Well, well the Gentiles never did. Well, the, the Jews would, the Jews. Uh, would, would observe Jewish both. They, they observed both. So they, they never stopped because that was part of their covenant. God had said, worship on the Sabbath, which would be Friday night to Saturday night. But then they would meet again in people's homes on Sunday to commemorate the resurrection. There must have been some council where they decided, you know, we're getting together on Sundays and, you know, we'll longer have a responsibility to go on Saturday. I'm sure. There had to been a meeting. <laughs> there had to be yes, right, there had to be a committee. There was probably even notes. And so, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Uh, um, let's watch the the text there. There's uh, eight is about generosity. You're going to see that in the video. Uh, he's disappointed, and the Corinthians have not collected money for the church back in Jerusalem, and he's going to give them what for for that. Yeah. And, but there's a, you know, he's going to tie generosity in with the gospel. That's really 
quite interesting. Uh, and, and if you take a look at 10, um, by the meekness and gentleness, this is where the change of tone comes in, where people think, ah, is this is the second letter. Why is he getting so upset so late in the letter? But by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid, uh. quote, timid <laughs> when face to face with you, but bold when I'm writing my letter. We understand that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. All caps. Email all caps. But when I'm with you, it's all honey and cream. Maybe he was just leading up with all the taking care of business, all these things that needed to be done. And like here, now this is what I really think I have to say. See, I think that's right. And we all experience that sometimes with our kids, right? You know, yeah. when they're there, you're all nice. And then when they leave, we go, oh, I didn't say what I really needed to say. Mm -hmm. So then you write that, you write that letter, you know, or, or that text. <laughs> yeah, while you were here, I just forgot to mention. Yeah. Boom. I was afraid to mention. I was afraid to mention, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's tee up the Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Even though it's called 2nd or 2 Corinthians in our Bibles, there are multiple clues within this letter that it's not the second thing he ever wrote to the church of ancient Corinth. Paul started this Jesus community in Corinth some time ago on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the story in the book of Acts chapter 18. And after moving on, Paul got a report that things were not going well there. So he wrote the letter that we call 1 Corinthians to correct these problems. And it appears that many in the church rejected Paul's teaching in that letter and rebelled against his authority. And so we learn in this letter that Paul had followed up in person with what he calls the painful visit. And after that, he sent a letter which he says was written with anguish and tears. And so after all these measures, most, but not all, of the Corinthians realized their arrogance and they apologized to Paul. They wanted to reconcile. And so Paul wrote this letter to assure them of his love and commitment. The letter's been designed with three main sections, each addressing a distinct topic. So Paul first finalizes his reconciliation with the Corinthians. Then in chapters 8 and 9, he addresses the topic of forgotten generosity. And in the final chapters, Paul challenges the remaining Corinthians who still reject him. Let's dive in and you'll see how it all works. So Paul opens up by thanking the God of all mercy and comfort who brought peace and encouragement to him and the Corinthians during this time of division and dispute. He acknowledges that things have been tense since this painful visit and he makes clear he's forgiven them. He wants an open and honest relationship. But why had they rejected Paul in the first place? Well, we discover later in this letter that the Corinthians had disregarded Paul as a leader. He was poor, he earned a meager living through manual labor, he was under constant persecution and suffering, he was often homeless, and to top it off, he wasn't a very impressive public speaker. And so once the Corinthians were exposed to other, more wealthy, impressive Christian leaders, they started to think less of Paul. They were actually ashamed of him. So Paul responds first by showing that their elevation of these leaders simply because of their wealth and eloquence is a betrayal of Jesus. It shows a totally distorted value system. True Christian leadership, Paul says, is not about status or self-promotion. Paul depicts himself and the other apostles as captive slaves to King Jesus, who's leading them on a procession of triumph. Paul's job isn't to be impressive, but rather to point people to the one who is. Jesus. He then alludes to the recent demand of the Corinthians that he provide some letters of recommendation to prove his authority and credentials. And this is ridiculous to Paul. Their church wouldn't even exist if he hadn't started it. And so he says they are his proof of genuine leadership. They are his letter of recommendation. He cleverly quotes from the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying that God's spirit has written his letter of recommendation on their hearts as his new covenant people. The Corinthians shouldn't need any more proof than that. Now the mention of the new covenant, it leads Paul into a long comparison between the old covenant between God and Israel that was mediated by Moses and the new covenant between God and the Corinthians mediated by Jesus and the Spirit. The old covenant made at Mount Sinai, it was truly 
glorious. It made Moses himself shine with God's glory, but that glory eventually faded. Not to mention the fact that the laws of that covenant were ineffective at truly transforming Israel. But the new covenant, by comparison, is even more glorious because the resurrected Jesus is the very glory of God and he lives on forever. And it's his spirit that's now transforming people to become more faithful just like Jesus himself. Now this all sounds amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to share in God's own glory? But Paul goes on to show how the paradox of the cross turns upside down the Corinthians' ideas of glory and success. After all, Jesus' glorious exaltation as king took place through his suffering, execution, and death. On the cross, Jesus revealed God's salvation. He died for the sins of the world to reconcile people to God, but the cross does even more. It reveals God's character. He's a being of utter self-giving, suffering love that seeks the well-being of others. The cross also reveals a new cruciform way of life. And Paul's goal is that his life and ministry imitates the cross. So although his apostolic career, it's been marked by humility, suffering, by poverty, it was all to serve the Corinthians. And so when they disapprove of Paul's poverty and suffering, they disapprove of Jesus too. Paul's way of life and leadership is actually the proof that he authentically represents the crucified and risen Jesus. Paul really wants to reconcile with the Corinthians, but he won't let things lie until they've been transformed and embrace this upside down paradox of the cross. After this passionate appeal, Paul moves on to address the topic of forgotten generosity. So the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem, they had fallen into poverty due to a famine. And Paul was raising money among the new churches that he started, full of mostly non-Jews. They would all send a relief gift as a symbol of their unity in the Messiah, Jesus. And so many of his churches, they were thrilled to give. But the Corinthians, in the midst of all this conflict with Paul, hadn't saved up for the gift. And for Paul, this isn't just about money. It's another sign that the Corinthians have not been transformed by the gospel about Jesus, which at its heart is a story of generosity. Paul says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, that even though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. He's telling the story of the gospel through financial metaphors. Jesus gave up his glorious honor, or wealth, and he lowered himself to die like a poor slave, so that other people who are impoverished through sin and death can be exalted and become wealthy through the riches of God's grace. To be a Christian is to let this story sink deep into your mind and heart, letting it transform you into someone who's more generous, more willing to share your life and resources to help others. In the final section of the letter, Paul focuses on the main source of his conflict with the Corinthians, that group of impressive leaders that he sarcastically calls super apostles. So they came to Corinth promoting themselves and bad-mouthing Paul as a poor, unsuccessful leader. And at the risk of sounding self-promoting, Paul says, do these guys really want to compare credentials? He can totally take them on. Are they Jewish Bible experts? Well, so is Paul. He was a Pharisee, for goodness sakes. He has the whole Bible memorized. Do they want to brag about their superior knowledge of Jesus? Paul has actually seen and hung out with the risen Jesus. He's actually had visions of Jesus' heavenly throne room. But more importantly, Paul has given his entire life to the mission of Jesus. He sacrificed comfort and stability, and he never asked the Corinthians for money. Unlike the super apostles who charged a lot, Paul earned his own living. But, Paul says, he refuses to brag about these accomplishments because these aren't the things that really matter as a Christian. Instead, what he'll brag about is how flawed and how weak he is because it's in those inadequacies that he discovers the love and mercy of Jesus. Or as Jesus once told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect through weakness. Paul concludes the letter with a sober warning to the Corinthians. They need to check themselves. Their contempt for Paul, his way of life, their love for these super apostles, it all shows that they don't grasp who Jesus is on a fundamental level. They're not living like transformed followers of Jesus, and so he invites them once again to humble themselves before the love of Jesus. 2 Corinthians gives us a really unique window into the life of Paul and the paradox set before us by the cross of Jesus. The cross challenges our values, our ways of seeing the world. We value success, education, wealth, but God values humility and weakness because his love and power were made known through the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. 
The cross also unleashes the transforming power and presence of the Spirit to empower Jesus' followers to take up his cruciform way of life and make it their own. And that's what 2 Corinthians is all about. Reactions. That said he did know Jesus. Yeah, that's no. what I was... Yeah, that he didn't know Jesus, that he had seen the risen Jesus, I think was the word. Yeah, he got caught. So I, I'll have to go check this. I, I think he's talking about visions of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus knocks him off the horse. Remember, he says, I got caught up into the heaven. third heaven. heaven. So I think he's talking about visions rather than I was in his presence before or after the resurrection. So I, I think, and that's what the super apostles are questioning. You, you weren't there. And he's saying, oh, yes, I am. But he's kind of stretching the argument, mm -hmm. I think, in my, in, my, in my mind. They kept emphasizing that Paul was so poor. And that bothered me because he was so highly educated. How How is he so poor if he were so highly educated? Well, I mean, at the end, he said, you know, I'm a Pharisee. I know all these things. But before that, then they were emphasizing his poverty. And he was a tent maker and he supported himself. So, yeah. These super apostles mm -hmm. will give me your money. And right. Right to them. I think because he ran his own business um, and was traveling all the time, that's not a good mix. No. You know, it's just not like you can work one day a week, <laughs> travel the rest. Right. So he's at ten. So he could set up his shop at any town just to make a few bucks. So when I think of Paul, I think about um, some of our kids. I don't want to paint this too closely, but you know, when when they leave college, they go out to Denver and then they work with on the slopes, help as a ski instructor, and they're there as long as there's snow on the ground yeah, right yeah. then they go to wisconsin and and you know they help with fishing or with skiing and then you know they can always go somewhere and make it are they making a lot of money no but they are enjoying themselves moving from itinerant work to itinerant work so and so he's this is but his argument is okay i'm not rich but I'm not asking you for money either. Yeah, I'm not a burden. Mm -hmm, I mean, that's his big point. Yeah. He doesn't mind the, 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 the word. I would say poor probably here means modest, that he, he's making enough to make it. I think he did. He, he but there might have been some family. there might have been some wealthy families at times too who, yeah. who raised. But here he is, not making a lot, let's say living modestly, but he's raising tons of money to send back. Yeah. So it's a big deal for him here, you know, but mostly I'm not a burden. And he tells the Corinthians, you're not paying your fair share with the Macedonia church, which was very poor, was willing to send money very generously to Jerusalem. He was doing what Christ asked his apostles to do. Yeah. Let everything go and go out and speak the word and you right. will be taken care of. And he might have had all that, but he gave it all up for the mission after Christ said, you know, I want you. I think it's a good point because, you know, the sending out of the 12 or the sending out of the, of, of the 70. Remember that? Don't take anything, don't take anything with you. No purse. Because the idea was to live off of hospitality. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Who, whoever welcomes you, stay there. Yeah, yeah, and don't leverage it and say, oh, that was nice. But somebody else offered me a bigger bed and a bigger room. Or, <laughs> no, you stayed where the hospitality was. But if someone didn't provide you hospitality, that's still that's 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 move on. And and move since on. he was staying extended periods of time, you can't have expect hospitality indefinitely. So we worked. I, I think that's it, right. And you know, we had that uh, in uh, church history with uh, the Methodist circuit riders. That was very famous, you know, where they get on their horse and they go out and preach the gospel and they well, lived off the hospitality. A Lutheran, wasn't, didn't he do that? Who? Henry Melchior, whatever, mm -hmm. yes. Um, well, I, we used to be, only reason I know that, we used to live in Lancaster and we went to a really, really, really old church and he had been to that church at one point. 
So he uh, he's established the Lutheran Church, yeah, uh, especially in Pennsylvania, but well, throughout. And so they were like circuit riders, and he would go places. And you know that was uh, part of our colonial era, right? Is you go to place to place, depending on the hospitality of people, and that goes back to biblical times, which is why they valued hospitality, because otherwise you're kind of vulnerable when you travel, right? Anything else, reactions to things that you picked up in the video that... Uh... Well, Why the generosity to Jerusalem? The poor. Famine? Yeah. I think Paul... Okay, he killed enough early Christians who were Jewish. Uh, and I think by spreading out with the Gentiles and having such success, I think there's a sort of an acknowledgement of where I came from. Yes. That well, this is our roots. This is where we come from. We're adopted. You'll use that language later on. So it would almost be like if you grew up in, let's say, modest or poor situation and you come into some wealth and then you go back and you say, mom and dad, you know, we're going to buy you a house or we're going to do something to help you in your life as an acknowledgement, you know, of, of the sacrifice you gave to me that put me in a good situation in life. And I think there's a lot of that giving back. And he wants other Gentiles. It's not just about him. He wants other Gentiles to acknowledge this. These are our roots. This is the church from which we come. We got to acknowledge that, otherwise it'd be easy for Gentiles just to go off and say, "Well, those are you know." Was this, was this the time that the had the persecution started yet in Rome? Could that have been part of it? I don't remember what. I I don't remember exactly, but you can look it up. Google. Uh, it was before Nero, um, and I can't remember um, now the Roman where it starts, but it starts pretty early. So I, I would assume, I, I want to say yes, but I'm not absolutely uh, sure because the, the Christians were an easy scapegoat. We can blame all the problems on, on these Christians and they had such funny practices anyway. You know, they, they drink blood and they eat bodies and, and who knows what they're doing down there in the catacombs. And, you know, so it was an easy group to beat up on. I think Paul was trying to unify the two groups, the Jewish Christians and the Gentiles to get them more unified. And that was a big thing to do. Also, when you have your discussions, this role of the cross, how he's bringing the cross, uh, and remember the, the financial metaphor he uses here, that Christ uh, becomes poor, dies so that we can become rich and live in his blessings. So it sounds like a little bit of the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. But he's using that to say Christ did this and now we're called also to be poor and to weak and this is where those those great quotes I see Christ um, Christ's glory coming through my weakness and I think some of us you know would say that that's been part of our experience that sometimes you see Christ better through the weakness because you know it's Christ and not and not part of your own strength that you're achieving uh, which is fine too but here he's he, he almost glories, Paul does, in his weakness, uh, because then he expects uh, Christ's witness to be more evident through him. All right, let's get in our groups. You're not going to get an answer. Yes, she's had her hand up. Awesome. Sometimes. Um, it's just that, you know, the, the disciples, the early apostles, the center of the Jewish based Christians, was around Jerusalem, and if they're having a famine, I mean, if you want to be accepted by them, send them on. You know, he's coming up with more Christians, and they're sending the money. That would make him much more acceptable. Uh, yeah. So a, a good, aside from just general, a good political move. Uh, anything? that you discussed in your groups that you want to bring forward, insights that you had into 2 Corinthians.
I was I was sure you were going to discuss which line to cross to date. This is, I hope that when we leave 2 Corinthians, there's a, to guard the story of what's happening. Paul founding a church, 1 Corinthians problem solving with the gospel, visits, rejection, some reconciliation, and now another letter, maybe two letters, um, both as signs of healing and reconciliation, but also fending off these uh, fake these fake apostles, right? And then still some of the tensions. It wasn't all healed. It wasn't just a kumbaya moment. You know, there's still issues. And we get that at the end of the book as well. Why that's comforting, I think, is it's really realistic yeah. about how church actually works. And that they hung in there. Paul hung in there. And... I just love that when the super apostles say, well, where are your credentials? Whoa. Where's your letters of, recon uh, of recommendation? And he goes, there they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you are my <laughs> letters of reconciliation. You've come to faith. You formed a church. You know? So that's a really powerful thing. Uh, one announcement, two, two announcements before we go. Uh, we are going to start happy hours. going to be brought back um, in June. And we'll run that probably to the end of the year. Um, what I'm, day is happy hour? It's gonna, it's gonna be on Mondays okay. at the same time as Worship Matters from four to five. Um, we're gonna ask Dennis Russell again to introduce the wine of the week. <laughs> we'll announce that Sunday morning in service. You know. <laughs> uh, but we'll do something, we'll announce that. Then we will still have the Worship Matters. We'll just ask quickly, what do you take away from the service? On Sunday. Will that be part of the happy hour? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we'll keep that part of, of the discussion. Um, any major takeaways? Anything you you know? What impressed you? What what questions you have coming from the service? Then we will start the different episodes of the chosen. Mm -hmm. So we'll actually watch the episode. Then we don't watch it ahead of time. They got to watch it ahead of time. So that's why we're going to uh, set this up way ahead of time, so you know. First episode will be the first Monday of June. And we're going to start from the beginning. Because some of us, I mean, we like them, but we haven't seen them for a couple of years. And I think it builds, you know, the personalities build from, from uh, first episode. You know, we all remember Matthew kind of right out there, and Peter, you know, right in those early episodes, of Mary Magdalene. And then that we can see the whole flow over uh, the four seasons. So the first season is also the easiest because you can find that almost any place now. It's on Netflix. That's just easy. But when we start uh, later in the summer with the second season, then it's going to get a little trickier. Yeah. And we'll, we'll most, I think we have to have the apps, but it'll give us eight, nine weeks to set everybody up with those who don't have the chosen app or other ways yeah. to uh, plug in. Also, today's a very special day, day of prayer. Jim, anything? Yeah, the National Day of Prayer. Um, this is the official one. <laughs> there was a time I came in here uh, and it wasn't necessarily the official one. But I was just I was just saying to the group who allowed me to speak for a moment that um, I don't know how as Americans we cannot be walking around with a deep sense of grief and a deep sense of concern and a deep sense of worry. Um about what seems to be continually unfolding. And um, <clears throat> there, I, I just say that because there's not a person I, there's not an adult I talk to that doesn't go, Ugh, you know, like, you know, like that. So everybody's feeling that. And I think one of the, the, the quandaries is that how, how do we, how do we, okay, if we're here, how do we, how do we, how do we progress? How do we move forward, right? Um, and so is it at a tipping point? I don't know, yada, 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 but, um, I think we need to pray and I know you're all not going to stay, but do you mind if, if I say a prayer, is that okay, pastor? Mm -hmm. I, I close this in prayer and then, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. add, add that on. We're still going to pray, but I know many of you have to go, 
But if you can stay, we're praying today for a few minutes. All right, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Dear Heavenly Father, gracious God, we thank you for today, for life and health and every blessing. Lord, thanks so much for this church, a chance to come uh, to grow in our faith, to connect with our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, to learn from your word. We thank you for uh, Pastor Rick and uh, the years and years of, 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 of being with him and leading him on his freight journey. And we ask for a continued blessing on him and all the pastors here and the deacons. And uh, Lord, so we again, turn our eyes just to our nation, this day of prayer, where it actually says all, all religions are invited to pray uh, for peace and for goodwill and for your will, Lord, to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord, our hearts go out. Uh, we, we, we see the TV, the, the, we hear on the radio as we're driving our cars. We hear through our neighbors and friends and brothers and sisters the, the turmoil and the tension, Lord. So our hearts are heavy. And we, we pray, Lord, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's the kingdom of God. So we pray, Lord, for your kingdom to come. We pray for leaders and for movement of interaction uh, that's, that's being talked about behind the scenes right now. Uh, uh, the actually situation going on in Israel and with Hamas. And Palestine, Lord, so we pray, Father, today, uh, united, we pray, Lord, that your righteousness and your truth and your compassion and mercy and justice would prevail and move forward. We ask all this in your name. Amen. 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 Thanks, yeah. everybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah.